Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I'm doing a series of webinars, which was during the pandemic, but as we move out of the pandemic, which it certainly seems we are, we're going to keep rolling with these webinars as long as we can. We have great guests lined up for the rest of the month. And of course, our favorite people are back with us today, Sharon and Laura Wilsey. I think this is like your 11th webinar with me. Okay, right? we, just, so. we just have so much fun. We just keep doing this. Um, so welcome, Sharon and Laura. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us again. Again, it's just great because, you know, every time we talk, there's some other little feature that comes out or a better way to describe things. And I just think it's fascinating and so interesting. So um, just for those who may not know about horse speak, can you just give us a brief uh, uh, overview of what horse speak is? Yes. <laughs> I think That's, we should be able to do that think, by now. I think by now, maybe I have it. I can do it. It's what it's, but it's hard to to describe, right? Like Surefoot's hard to describe. Like, and it evolves. I've noticed every time I ask you that question, the answer's a little different, which I love because it means that it's not static. It, yeah, it's definitely not static. I guess the simple answer is um, horse speak is the analysis of of how horses use their body language to communicate with each other. And also it includes a lot of what they communicate about. So how do they um, create safety, harmony, and well-being in a herd, in a healthy herd? And then the second side, the second half of that is how can we um, basically manufacture the same gestures, postures, and signals, even though our body shape is totally different, so that we can have the same positive effect on our horses and communicate the same essential things to them that a, a, an actual leader horse would be doing. And when I say actual leader horses, we have an old fashioned sort of dominant submissive construct about um, horses, but it's, it's not true. It doesn't, they don't really work that way. They're a collaboration and there's usually several leaders and they have different roles and they do different things. And what their primary purpose, the primary purpose of a leader horse is to provide safety, protection, well-being, harmony to help reestablish um, what I call inner zero, which is inner calm. If there's been a spook, if the whole herd got startled by something, the, the primary horses are gonna give the signals that are calming signals or safety signals or things like that. And what's really cool about learning this stuff is that what the, the primary reason we have a hard time with horses is because they, they worry they get spooky, they get, we, we don't understand their thinking patterns. Sometimes they, they have reactions to things that don't make sense to us because our brains work differently. So just basic understanding of who they are, what they're talking about, how they're talking about it and how we can uh, benefit from learning that kind of stuff because we, it can help us communicate better, build better rapport and ultimately help the horse that we're working with feel safer around us because that's what makes them want to pay attention to us because then we're the leader in the room mm -hmm. that is determining that's safe, that's not safe. This is how we're going to do this. You know, they don't have a problem uh, hanging out with us and doing what we want them to do. They have a problem feeling safe because they're a prey animal. That's, that's number one thing. They have a problem with it. And even horses who are stoic or who are leaders benefit from receiving those messages from a person because it means they're off the hook. While you're there, they can relax so they can pay attention better and they can follow your instructions or get the education or do what you're asking them to do without inner stress because inner stress wears down bodies. That's what we know. Yeah. You know, yesterday my guest was Janet Jones um, who wrote Horse Brain, Human Brain. And it was fascinating because she was talking about the, the difference in the way a, a horse perceives things and the way a person perceives things. And, you know, we, <laughs> It so fits with what you're doing because I, 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 my sense of horse speak is that it gets the person to be present. Mm -hmm. And when we're in human brain, we're thinking about what has happened, what's going to happen. Um, you've, you know, you've seen that before. We, uh, uh, there was one particular thing that she described now, and I can't forget, uh, I've lost the words for it, but there's a way in which we process information that horses absolutely can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, associations. Um, yeah. There was a different way she put it, but you know, this is a log, that's a log, that's a log. They're all logs. Horse says, this is one thing, that's another thing, that's another thing. I don't know what those three things are. And right. so for, after listening to Janet and, I, and, and knowing that I was having you as a guest today, it was interesting because I think 
that what horse speak does is it it more puts us in that present position of how horses are seeing the world yes. instead of how humans see the world to the horse. Yes, I, I, that's, you know, it's so funny because this actually piggybacks. It must be the ether is talking because <laughs> this is kind of, a, you know, two things that occurred in our club yesterday. Um, one thing was how I was doing some work with our horse, Mummy, who is, a little bit at hesitant. times she gets hesitant. She does get a little stressed about the environment. And so I had set up a ring of cones and I was going clockwise leading her on the left side. And she was perfect. So that's it was counter. like, no, she was going oh, okay. clockwise. Yeah. So she's on the inside. She's on the, the, inside. the inside. I'm on the outside toward <laughs> the fence line. Okay. And then I'm like, okay, mommy, we did one circle. Let's go the other direction. Which puts so the horse on the outside. Um, if I'm going to lead on the left side, going counterclockwise, right. mommy is now toward the fence line in the woods. Hesitancy all over the place. And yeah, she may, she has a little bit of a physical thing with her left shoulder. Okay. But we're not doing any speed. We're just walking. But the fact is I made her protect me because she's on the outside of, of the position. circle. And so it's interesting to think about I went by the rules of horsemanship lead on the left side. And then we had the discussion yesterday during the club. I went back out. We did the cones, did the same thing. Cl clockwise was perfect. And then I was like, all right, mommy, I'm going to lead you on the right side when we go counterclockwise. So I am toward the fence, uh, the wood line. And she was perfect. Yeah. So um, somebody who was at yesterday's webinar says it's categorical perception. She took notes, oh. um, <laughs> which is great. Oh yeah, we heard that word before yes. too. Yeah. yeah, and so we categorize things, yeah. right? Uh, a cup is a cup is a cup is a cup, even if it's tall, short, small, big. You know, to a horse, it's an object, a different object, another object, and yet another object. And so they can't categorize things the way we can. Right. And, and, and that what, that's when we get into the, you should know that. Right. You yes. know, you went past that yesterday. Why are you doing this today? You're just doing this to me. You know, yeah. all of those storylines that we start telling ourselves because we're, we're not putting ourselves in the position of how the horse sees the world. And, yes. and so, not only, not only how they see the world, but more and more evidence coming out how they smell the world. Yes, that was brought out yesterday that the sense of smell is like at the level of possibly a bloodhound. Yeah, yeah. which, which is, would make sense. And I, we've no, we are now seeing it where a horse goes, they'll use uh, manure. We've talked about this before. They'll use manure to make a safety object to make a, a, a scent uh, marker on a spot to say, this is safe. When they're relaxed, they produce pheromones that smell relaxed. So that is a safe manure pile. If they're not relaxed or they're tense or they're even scared, they do shoot a poop. And that has a whole different kind of, kind of <laughs> smell can, to it. And we can smell the you difference. You can definitely like, smell the difference. You know, horse poo <clears throat> is actually doesn't smell that bad, you know, like compared to like cow. Oh, or know? dog. Yeah. Or dog. So, but then when you do smell the stress poo, it is a similar like tang. Acrid. It's tangy like and acrid. The cow. Right. And we now we've it's been around so many horses that are changing as we're working with them. They're dropping into that inner zero. So they're they're getting into parasympathetic more. And the the poo, they'll make a safety poo and it smells really warm and friendly. And when, when they first get in there, they might make a stress poo and it smells really bad. And it's great to have people go smell the poo. <laughs> okay, so so but people are we going to start having it. smell tests where we'll line up all different poos and you have to smell them and tell us what's going on with the horse? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, you, it's really weird, but you can, like, you I, can. You know, I can smell poop and be like, I think that horse has an ulcer. Like, there's there's a different, because we've we've tuned into it. So right. if you're not tuned into it, you wouldn't notice. Yeah. But I, I kind of, you know, I started thinking this way a little bit more after I talked to a researcher, who local researcher in Putney, Vermont, who... Um, finds whale scat to, to determine the health of whales. And he had a dog specially trained to sniff on the open ocean, on the open water, to smell in the direction of whale scat. Wow. And I was like, how the hell did you do that? And he's like, he works for this tennis ball. 
when when we find the whale scat, he gets the tennis ball. So that dog is like, where's the scat? And so it's it's a, it's a beagley type dog. And yeah, I was like, holy cow. So <clears throat> just thinking, smelling stuff out in the open water, that's incredible. And the, yeah. the idea that horses could smell on that level just really takes it to a whole other place. Right. And, and we so underappreciate that because we don't have that capacity. We just don't. We no. can't smell the things that dogs and horses can smell. So they don't exist in our world. But we, as she was pointing out, you know, vision is our primary. Vision is what we do. So we see something and go, that's a rock. And the horse goes, that smells like a deer or a bear or a pet. Right. Or a, and we're like, nah, it's just a rock. And so we're in this conflict between our visual perception of the world and their olfactory perception of the world, in addition to their other senses, their, their feet to the ground. Um, you know, um, Lucinda Baker was on the other day and she talked about you know, the ears, eyes, uh, nose, taste, and of course feet perceiving the ground and the world. And um, I think that their feet are so much more sensitive than our feet because uh, because of the way they're wired and because of their sh they're encapsulated well and they're they're cupped right and so so like you know on the speaker on a speaker old especially old fashioned speakers right you, the uh, the the aspect of the speaker that uh, the drum part is cupped so that's that's able to perceive vibrational elements like you know they they now know that all this stuff about um, elephants giving and receiving messages through the earth that their feet are receiving right and I think horses have something similar. I don't know that they have that low rumble that elephants are doing because I don't, apparently you perceive that in your body, your body gets a shudder. But um, I don't know that horses are making that sound, but I think they're, what I've noticed is that the sound that their hooves are making makes sense to them. And so when one horse starts to walk low and slow, which is what you'll see a leader horse, like say a mentor or you know a nurturer, that saying, okay, let's keep it cool. They walk low and so it's a very specific footfall that they use and it's it's heavy, it's rhythmical and it's 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 like um, there's gum on their feet, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, and when you see horses that are really tense, they're like scrabbling. The, the feet are just sort of paddling around like a cartoon animal and they're tick, 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 and they have a harder time getting into their feet and getting grounded. So when there's a training mechanism, a training system that says you got to move that horse's feet to get them to think, uh, it only applies if the horse can relate to their feet. So if they're, mm. if they're not relating to their feet, then that doesn't work because it just makes them more scattered. And everything that horses have taught me, it basically is, is how do horses help other horses? Why is it that when you look out on, a, on a, any given day and a, a generic herd, they're not doing anything. There's a real reason why they look like that and why when they're with us, they're doing a lot of times a lot of things. So we get them and we up the energy level immediately just by showing up. And then it's hard for them to pay attention and it, they make, it makes them feel like there's imminent danger. Mm -hmm. So when we show up and we have intensity, like I'm going to a show in a month and I got to get you ready and you need to be doing, we need to work on that canter transition and other, but when you're thinking, or the and we have, when you show up and I have one hour, I have one hour to do this thing, <laughs> but you're, but you're here. All yeah. they perceive is, the is that you're here and they're like, you're, you're my leader and you're saying this. And so there must be something in the environment that's out to get us. And you're not pointing to what it might be. So it must be up to me to figure out what it is. Now, if you have a stoic leader type horse, they might go, all right, I'll, I'll try to take care of the two of us. But if you have any other type of follower horse, they're like beyond themselves with the, I don't know where the boogeyman is. I don't know, it, we're not safe because you don't look safe. Right. And, you know, somebody's just put in the chat and I was thinking about this, you know, the gated horses move you're like your passos. Uh, um, and she's saying that um, it's <laughs> riding a three-gated big horse the first time with a gated horse. And when they start to toll, the big horse often jumps into the sky because, you know, that kind of busy footfall to another horse might be an alert system, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Riding a gated horse is so fascinating because you feel like you're just floating. Yeah. It's... It, wild it's just like you're going like their feet are moving so fast but you're not really going you're that just, fast just like, <laughs> yeah, because all gates are walk i mean they're all four beat um yeah. so 
um, it's an interesting sort of thing because it's a walk, but it's a speed walk. And so the other horses aren't sure necessarily what to do with that if they're not familiar with a gated horse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because we it, had, you know, we had a case one time um, with this horse who had some neurological issues and he was getting placed with a, an older mare. He was an older horse too. And she had lost her pen mate and he had lost his pen mate. And so we were there just to kind of supervise the, the meeting of the two because she didn't want, he had some neurological stuff and she didn't want him to get bullied or push her, you know, she just wanted to be sure. So we kind of had eyes on that first meeting and everything went really well, really swimmingly. And she contacted us a few days later and with, with some video and the mayor was leaning her shoulder into his shoulder and, and encouraging him to walk and walk and walk and walk. And then every now and then she'd switch to the, the weaker side and, and he'd start to kind of stumble and fall over. And so then she'd run back over to the more sturdy side and stabilize him until he could stabilize himself better. And then she sent, a, like even a few days later, a picture of him cantering with her. Wow. But she just got up there and she said, we're going to walk, we're going to walk, we're going to walk. And when he said that's enough, she'd say, okay, and they'd go graze. You know, so he could, he had the, the agency to say that I don't want anymore. And that's, but she, it was amazing to see her step into that role with him. And she was that type of horse that could do that because not, that's like the nurturing type, the mothering type that would be able to be like, <clears throat> you need a little help friend and I've got your back. And another horse might not be able to handle that. Right because they might have some kind of limitation in him having a weakness that would just freak them out and be like, and it wouldn't work out. So it was fascinating to be a part of this integration to observe her with him. And it was like, right from the get go, we could tell that it was gonna work out well because she was soft and she would leave him for a moment and come back. And it was just, there was never any kind of intensity toward that horse. She had all the, mentorly qualities that that one would need in that situation yeah so, um, somebody's asking do you think a certain gait and a gated horse promotes more relaxation um, my gut feeling says slow <laughs> yeah you know because when you add speed to the <laughs> horses all the legs start going faster so um uh but somebody's commenting that that sounds like that mayor was like a physical therapist to that horse that she, she was she innately knew that <clears throat> to move him. Very interesting. Very I think she was a brood mare at one point. Yeah, I think she? so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, it sounds to me like there's a, a mothering quality to her. Right. Yeah. But I have seen um, nurturing mentor geldings that have done a, a similar type of thing. And, and then I've, we've also seen horses that are put together and nobody can calm down. And, and largely there's no, neither of the horses a leader type. And so they're like, I don't know, what do you think? 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 I don't know, we should just run. <laughs> no one's here to save us. Yeah. So then what's neat about this is you, there's ways you can start inserting yourself as I am. I'm, I'm the mentor, I'm the protector, I've got your backs. And enough of those messages over a couple of days or even in, in extreme cases, a couple of weeks, but the horses start to go, oh, there is a protector here. We so do what the human is. What are the different sort of character uh, types? You talked about a protector and you've talked about um, a mentor. So what are what are the different types of, of roles, I guess is the word. Yeah, roles. Well, first of all, <laughs> we do have a webinar that has the complete information that you're asking about <laughs> on our website, SharonWilsey.com. It's called understanding the horse personality. Because there's there's so much to yeah, it. Yeah, there's so much right. to it. Right. Yeah. The names of them so that so yeah, that yeah. Oh, absolutely. sure. I'm, you know, insert plug when <laughs> when you can. But it's good stuff. And and you know, I, we've done this. We've chunked stuff down because you go on into these rabbit holes, and then we're like, we have to make a webinar about this because there's yeah. so much in that rabbit hole. And one of the, I just want to say, Wendy, where this comes from in my thinking. So I'm not just, it's not just my opinion. It's, it, you know how you get an instinct, you see a horse and you just get it, you just know something. So my work is to say, okay, but how, what are the markers that my brain saw so that I can make myself know what those markers are? 
What are, what are the things, I'm, what are the pattern recognitions I'm getting here? So I take that instinct and I take it down and I take it apart and I reverse engineer it. And I'm like, where did it start? What was the first moment that I had a, hmm, and why did I start going in that direction? What are the comparatives? What other horses have I seen that have reminded me of this? What are the patterns I saw there? What are the patterns I'm starting to see here? And part of that is my own sense perception. So my own physical nature perceiving the quality that that kind of horse is putting out. What is it? What are they making my body feel like? What are they making my emotions feel like? And what, how does that match with what I see? So that's how I've arrived at this. And so with that in mind, um, the top horses that I'm looking for for leadership positions are map makers, which are solid horses that say, I know the way and I'm calm, not runners. Map makers are not like run for the hills. That's usually a joker. Jokers might run for the hills because it's like, and say how many different types have you identified just so that we have a- I believe there's a dozen. Okay. Yeah, there's a little bit more than that. Jokers. Yeah. The, the big ones that people, that people need to know about are jokers because a lot of people are attracted to jokers because they're often cute. They have a cute face. They're oh. cute. They want to get in your, they, they act like puppies. There's something that we relate to a little bit more because they want, they pop your bubble. They want to be close to you. They usually like affection. They're funny. They're clever, like to their demise because they'll open all the locks and get out and let everybody else out too. And he, he, isn't this fun. They're difficult to train because they're, they're so, they're a little bit like ADD in a horse. Um, so a mentor type horse is one who has that heavy, slow footfall they react last, they're, they're the least likely to react. Um, they tend to be stoic, they tend to be thoughtful. We often call them a plug. So a lot of people don't like them for a primary riding horse because you feel like they don't shine and they don't, they, that's not really what they wanna do. You, you can find a mentor who's got some other attributes and so they're a solid, ace in the whole riding horse and that's everybody wants to ride that horse because they don't do anything crazy they don't buck they take care of their rider they know what they're doing da, 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 da. Um, but how many of them do you actually find you know the the solid gold riding horse for like a riding program or something like that there's few and far between uh, so i think that nature sort of inherently so this is the nature nurture i think that nature inherently um, dillies out a certain amount of these qualities and characteristics in a healthy herd. You need a little salt and pepper. You need a little bit of everybody. You don't need a herd full of mentors because they compete. Oh, I think I'm going to make everything okay. Well, I think I'm going to make everything okay. I'm more okay than you're okay. Well, I'm more okay than you're okay. And it's just a thing. And that goes in the vein of like how you might have just two horses and they just can't settle down. And that's because they probably are the competitive, competitive roles. in the same role. And so no one can wants to step down in the hierarchy. So then you just have this running around all the time. So that's why sometimes the third wheel is nice because they can simmer it them triangulates down. triangulates the relationships. And usually horses have some level of flexibility. So if let's say you have a, there's another type that I call the king and they're not necessarily a mentor. Sometimes the king is just a show off. They're just, look at me, I'm amazing. They're very studly. They tend to be like sort of um, a little narcissistic. They can be wonderful to ride. They can be real showy and flashy and like working hard. There's something about that, uh, but they're not necessarily nurturing to other horses. They're more demanding of everyone around them. So let's say you have a king and then you also have a mentor. So the king might say to the mentor, get the hell out of here. I don't want anything. And the mentor slowly walks away. Well, all right, then I guess I'll go over here. And then you see that mentor just kind of hanging out in the outskirts all the time, not being able to integrate. On the other hand, if you have a weaker member, like a joker or a pawn, which the pawn to me is a, is a horse who just doesn't really have a place where they just want to follow. Kings love pawns. They're like, that's great. Perfect. You just stick with me. And they can be demanding and the pawn's like, that's okay. It makes me fine. think of Sir Richard and his little and his little mini. mini. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This big it was Belgian the only kind of drafty guy and a twin image of a pony size. Mini. Mini. And, and they, they were, were besties. And that yeah. was it. 
that yeah. the, the mini was too needy for it. no other horse could stand it. And, and the, Sir Richard had been a, a feral stallion and he just was like, that's my mini. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, listening to this, I can't help but think of two things. One, this is different than temperament type. Like we've talked with Karen ba uh, Kim Bauer and we're gonna do more on temperament typing, which is like five element Chinese theory. This is right. different, but compatible. And the other thing is, this is not dissimilar to group dynamics with people. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and, exactly. And we have, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. We have three, which on a, the beginner level of trying to look at a horse, figuring out its personality, we have the three energy types. So this is definitely easier to recognize. So we have stoic, hesitant, and outgoing. You can usually tell when you meet a horse, they're nervous, which is hesitant. They're stoic. They're just standing there. They're not moving around that much or they're outgoing. They're like, hi, I'm your horse today. <laughs> so you can usually get a good read on the, one of those. And then that leads you into, well, the, the categories that you would typically find there. It's not like exact cookie cutter, but it kind of will help you place the personality with the energy type. So it's like, right. and, you know. And really the bottom line goal for all of this is to help us understand how to interact with that horse in other words, if we have a really fearful horse, we don't want to come off with like forcing him to have to lead because he's not going to be able to do the job. Right. Exactly. But it, he would be a great horse to go second or third in line down the trail and he would just slip in and be happy as a clam. Yes. That's it. And, and so, we actually, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, so often we, you know, and this is where we, um, on Monday I had Allie Thurston, we talked about horse shopping 101 and and a lot of what she was talking about was, you know, making your list of what your wants and your needs are so that, and then taking an adult with you so that when you go shopping, you're not getting a horse that doesn't have the, the ability to do the job you want because it's going to be a mismatch. It's going to be horrible, right? If you want to be a tough event rider and you get a timid horse, this is going to be a problem. Right. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So you need an outgoing horse, but you need the right type of outgoing horse which is where we always come back to jokers. And a lot of people end up with the joker because they think this is going to be a great X, Y, Z horse. It's going to jump the fence. It's going to run the distance. It's going to do the thing. And they're not because they're really hard to train because they just don't have that mind. Yes, I have one of those right now. That I, <laughs> <laughs> I know he, what I'm talking like, about. Yeah. And, and he's, um, he's delightful. And he's, you know, some days you're just like, are you ever going to get this? And then one day it's there and you're just like, I don't know when that happened. Um, but it just feels like you're, you know, you're talking to the wall about simple things and then suddenly it's there. And he's yes. a fascinating horse. We're going to actually temperament type him with Kim Bauer next week. <laughs> nice. Um, because to see where he fits in the five element theory, because he is that type. And I was watching him just yesterday and he's the one that's grabbing the, the um, nibble. It's not a nibble, it's a hay pillow, but it's a mesh bag to limit. And he's flinging it all over. And I find it at the waterer, which is, you know, 200 yards away. It's a waterer. <laughs> to go bag. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and you're like that, <laughs> that, and the mayor didn't do that. So you are the only one left standing. Well, well it's, it's interesting the the five energy types, the Chinese medicine um, assessment of personalities. And we had, I have a friend who's a, uh, got her master's in Feng Shui. So she one day like looked at my horses. She was like, do, cause I have five primary horses. And she's like, do you realize that you have one of each element almost like on the nose? So, and I was like, really? And then she explained it. I was like, that is exactly who they are. I have, I have all of, of one of each five um, types. So it's, it's really just another lens, but yeah. it's interesting to see and then to see how those horses get along and why they do what they do. And um, some of the um, elemental needs, if you understand like what's up with a wood horse, you'll understand more about how they're going to learn and grow, which is different from like a water horse or yeah. an earth horse. So it's, that is really, really cool stuff. And I also um, have dabbled in like astrology for horses, you know, because, <laughs> because why not? Because astrology is a thing and it's already yeah. out there and you just look up your horse's birth date. And then there's a lot of stuff about the astrology for people. And you would just sort of superimpose some of the basics. And it's, it tends to be pretty interesting. I think 
getting a better handle on seeing horses not as objects or vehicles is is really what it's all about and the more we can see them for unique individuals um, their role in the herd is is an integrative connectivity to the other horses in the herd not a dominant submissive acting out so like in, in a wolf pack, you you have a lot of cohesiveness also that the pack needs to come together as a group. And you don't even have in a, in a wolf pack a strict alpha male, alpha female. The guy who invented that term later recanted it and was like, it was just a working theory. Yeah, David uh, Mack, I think his name was, he was the inventor of that concept of alpha male. And he later on was like, I it was just a working theory and I've decided it's not real. So I pull it, I take it back. Yeah, and like Monique said, she has these uh, PRE and a Frisian, and one's a hesitant choker and the other one's a stoic prince, and they have to have completely different approaches to interacting with them and training them. And we had this um, experiences with this gal who Sharon was communicating with on um, Messenger, and she was very good at seemingly identifying personalities and ended up talking to this lady at a tack shop yeah, and yeah. saying, I have, you know, this trail riding business and I'm having such a hard time with the horses, you know, going out together and there's a lot of hesitancy and da da da. And so the gal's like, tell me about a little bit about your horses. And our, um, our cohort said, you know what, you have them in the wrong order. So she's like identified the map maker, she identified a protector, and then there was some in the middle. And so the woman was like, okay, I'm gonna go home and try this. And she got her family riled up and got them on the horses and they never had a better trail ride. So it's interesting to think about who is the best leader to go in the front and who is a protector and who are those that can fill in the middle, you know, so then and they I, are in that position. And that's exactly the thing is, um, the point of all this is to help us better understand the horse's point of view so that we're not putting our uh, our categorical perspective on the horses, that we're seeing them as individuals, but relating to them in a simple way. And I think that it's always important to remember that they don't have the capacity to think the way we do. We right. have to think the way they do. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize their greatest concern, which is safety, and then how they organize to have that need fulfilled. And if it's not fulfilled, this is the, where the problems come in. We did a little video yesterday on the club where um, it was from a clinic that I just did. And, and it's, it's called the ring of cones because if, for, if you set up like say 10 cones in a, in a big circle and there's maybe five steps between cones. So that's the, that's the platform. But what you're really looking for is not just do the task, get from cone to cone to cone. You're, what you're looking for is how did we arrive? And if you're not nitpicking the horse, you're not saying you have to stop like this, that you're actually just open to having an experience, having experience yeah. with what, because as the horse goes around the cones, they're in a different relationship. They're in a different geometric pattern to the rest of the arena, to the other people in the arena, to the other horses in the arena. And we had a really fascinating um, video because there's two mares went in and they arrived, they, what they were able to do. And, and this is neat that the people just kind of fell into it. Like the mares were kind of like, this is how it has to be. And, <laughs> but we had nose to tail stop. So one horse is on this side of the ring of cones and the other horse is on this side and they're facing nose to tail, but they're parallel from each other. And if you took one horse and moved it like this to the next set of rings, the next set of cones, uh, they both looked at each other like, oh, we're out of position. We're no longer safe relative to each other. Here, we can watch out for each other's backs. Here, we're both open. Our flanks are exposed. Mm -hmm. And they, the horses really, because we were going slow enough and we were introspective enough and checking our experience enough, we were able to be um, communicating with those mares about what they're what they were interested in talking about. And what the mayors were interested in talking about is, I want you to keep me safe on this chessboard. And if you're gonna take me out of position with that other horse, then I need more messages from you that you've got me. And it was really fascinating. And I think the audience enjoyed it a lot because yeah. one person wrote in and she was like, you know, it wasn't until just now that I got it, that the horses are actually talking. 
like not just not just figuratively, not just sort of conceptually, but they're actually talking to each other. You could see them do it. And then when the human stepped in to say, no, I'll do it because they're mares, the mares were like, yeah, I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> Big tail swish. Big it was tail. crazy. The woman tried to just blow away the boogeyman at, for this mare and the mare is just like tail swish. No. And then I forget what you had her do. I just had her do, reposition herself, reposition herself, herself yeah. and do it a little bit more um, clearly. Yeah. And then the mayor relaxed and cocked a hit. Like it was instant response mm -hmm. or uh, someone's facing their core onto the horse and the horse just yields her head away. Very polite. But like, darling, that's a little bit loud. Your core is a little bit loud. Yep. And I said, oh, just reposition yourself so that your belly button's off the horse. And the horse just instantly straightened out her head and goes <sighs> like big sigh, like, drama like ah oh, that was finally you finally. figured it out yeah <laughs> you took your loud belly button off of me mares are so precise sharon always says that mares rule horse speak and geldings use it <laughs> so somebody's asking is um if the, those sessions are recorded like that one you're just talking about yes we have a library of our clubs we started last june so we have a full almost a full year of Basically, I think we missed one week throughout the whole year. Uh, so yeah. And this, this session you're on right now is also recorded and will be up on Wendy Murdoch's uh, YouTube channel. Yep, all this stuff is, uh, all of the Sharon Wilsey and Laura Wilsey show are recorded and they have their own playlist on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. So you can find them there anytime and uh, in order actually. And yeah. what's, what's interesting is working in, and this is where you, you and I collaborate all the time, Wendy, because working in where does surefoot come in to help a horse develop a different relationship to themselves but i'm also seeing it where horses can develop a different relationship to that environment to that specific corner of the world and if they have gotten a sense of safety well-being harmony in themselves they might be able to also double that out and relate that to that spot right so not only, even if the surefoot pads aren't there, but I think because they relate to safety objects, they'll make a poop to say this is safe. They'll put their nose on something. This is a safe object. This is, you know, and then they'll say, this is mine in a way, this is my barrel and they want to claim it. And that's their thing that they, my, my security blanket, I know where it is. Um, and we've had some people say, I can just take out the surefoot pad now and the horse might just sniff it and whew, there's a letdown. They didn't even need to get on it. Right. But it just, it's now starting to represent you're safe. Yep. So this is a safe place and you can relax and have a nice day and, you know, get into your body. We've seen that, like how these horses are just, you know, they're figuring out their body. Like it's a, you know, a new place to be when they're on the pads. Yeah. And we've even <laughs> had people um, in competition where the groom holds the blue pad ringside and the horse walks in the arena, sees the pad, completely chills out and performs. So they can see it even from a distance and still have that same, once they understand the comfort that it brings. Absolutely. You know, I, do you have an update on, um, on the horse that we, we had a couple of episodes ago, the horse where it wasn't integrating well in the herd and you put it on surefoot pads? I think it was a Palomino. Captain, Captain yeah. Um, loosely, I don't have a direct update, but I, I know that they, they Next have- webinar we will have better a better update for you because we're going to right heidi's house to have a clinic next weekend so we'll be taking eyes on so otherwise we'll it's be just, working with him it's just anecdotal and yeah. and after that session i think that it was easier for the family it was easy just things things smoothed out all around there's still the source has some distance to go he's he's just in one he of had those, his teeth done yeah he's gotten a lot of things done to him but he's mm -hmm. Um, there was some, there was a shift in which he was like, oh, people are here for me. Right. So that's a big thing. And again, like I was like, let's do surefoot pads for this horse in this environment at the, um, at the, the hitching post. Right. Again, to make it a safe place to be. So I think it's really neat to, you know, if you understand what horses are looking for to make themselves feel safe, that's, which is different. It's not petting. Petting is not naturally what they're looking for to make them feel safe. You may have a horse who particularly likes touch and might get it quickly that, oh, you mean, you mean for me to be soothed by this, but just as likely, it, it's more likely that horses, when you start touching them, when they're irritated or they're upset or they're stressed, it actually does the wrong thing because their nervous system is not ready to receive 
um, that contact and be in that kind of relationship. That's not what they do with each other. And that's similar to us too, because some people do want, if they're having a really hard time, they, some people want to be touched and some people are like, don't even go there, (laughs) you know? And sometimes if you are in a stressed out state and someone touches you, then you're grounding them more into their stressed out state. So it's kind of interesting to think about like the comparison of the two and horses don't value touch like we do. So it's more for us that we want to be like, oh, you're fine. And they're like, um, no, that's making it worse. Well, and I think that's different again than like what you do with T-Touch where you use an object to stroke the horse to outline their body and ground them because it's not a physical Mm -hmm. uh, energetic it's a it's a you know we use a wand and you stroke them and if you do it in a slow definite way it does ground but i think more importantly it outlines it says this is where you are in space because i think some stressed horses lose that perception definitely yeah i prefer using a stick of any kind whether you have a wand on you or not (laughs) you know a stick like break a branch off a tree if you have to because they like that it's so fascinating. And there's a couple of um, really hot branches that my horses love because they have these bends to them and it just gets right under like the belly or around the hind leg or something. I'm like, is your magic stick? And they're like, ooh, they come running over, rub me with my magic stick. Um, it, and it's soothing to them. Whereas the actual touch contact can be overstimulating. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and so there's all these subtle little nuances uh, about touch, you know, but I think it has so much to do with, we are energetic beings. And when we're touching a horse that's an energetic being, they're sensing that ener- energy, if you will, um, which can be comforting or disturbing. Yeah. But then the, the, the downfall is people then say, but well, then why the hell do I have a horse? Cause I want to touch it. So <laughs> I want to touch my horse. Like I have a need to feel this empathy and this connection with this animal. That's, that's you know, I, I, like I've been saying recently, the horse industry is, has switched to become a relationship industry. Yes. Because we're, we're in, that's what it is. It's about in, creating relationship. So the first stage to creating a real trusting relationship is to build that level of connection and trust and to learn about each other and what each other's like and don't like so that there's mutual rapport and not just I'm putting it on you. So it's not that you can't touch your horse but you have to learn what your horse's likes and dislikes are just like they need to learn yours and horses will come into you and they'll touch you and they'll do this i said do you like this can i can i pull on your jacket how about that you know and yeah exactly and so if we don't know how to say that's not what i want and we say eh like this they'll go oh games or you know why did that but but you came in and touched my face and you put a halter on me well i wanted to do this to you but that's not okay so there's there has to be a way to clearly define the bubble of personal space so that then you can have inclusion and have your bubbles be merged together of course because sitting on a horse is the biggest bubble popping thing you can do and it's a lot of touch the whole time you're sitting on them you're touching them so it's really smart to build up quality contact that the horse approves of and says i can deal with this i can manage and learn to like it like a lot of horses our horses like we stroke certain spots and it's always with the with the goal of releasing stress and my horses don't have a stressed out life right but just because i showed up i showed up with me and i brought a certain level of whatever i'm i'm in when i showed up and so it might you know just my presence you'll see them go oh mom's here and so I want to show up and go, that's okay. And the back, we don't yeah, have the back to do side of the hand is yeah. a great alternative. If you don't have a stick or a wand, yeah. if the horse is like hesitant on you touching them, try the back of your hand. Cause there's not as there's not the energy zap that's zapping through or the you started touching them and they, they got like yeah. frantic. Then you just switch it and you go to this. Yep. Cause that is non graspable. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, one of the words that's been kind of coming up for me, I've, I've been, as I'm driving around lately, I've been listening to books about habits and team building and that sort of thing. And, and one of the things that I'm starting to hear subtly, but consistently is allowing the horses a sense of autonomy. And whether that's, um, you know, like I was telling Janet when I was talking to her that the Joker, now that we have gotten past the, yes, you will put your halter on stage. Now I go to his stall after he's had his dinner and I hold the halter out and I wait 
And if he's ready, he puts his head in the halter. I'm not gonna stuff it on his head, but if he's not ready, he walks away and that's fine. I just go to another horse who is ready, mm -hmm. but it gives him some autonomy over a choice over mm -hmm. whether or not he's gonna go out that moment. You can choose to put your head in the halter and go out, or you can choose to stay in your stall and I'll go take another horse out. And there's something about the horses and it, and you know, that's such the basis of Surefoot. It's always been about a choice that the horse gets to choose, but I hadn't recognized that what that's doing is giving the horse autonomy. Right. And, and when I started to realize that it really shifts my perspective in terms of a more conscious awareness of what I'm doing. And I think that that's horse speak is giving the horse autonomy as well. You're saying, here's an option, you know, do, do you want this option? Oh, not that option, but you're saying this one. Right. Um, and I think that right. that's even what Janet's talking about is these horses have a brain um, and we can treat them like they're soldiers and they have to do what we tell them to do. But we can also have this relationship where there's a, a, an opportunity for them to show us like, I'm scared of this rock. Okay, I need to do something different. You're scared of this rock instead of you've got to go past it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, it's, it's interesting. I love everything you're bringing up. And the number one thing that people say after a statement like that is, but what about when they say no, mm. you know, but what about my goals? What about my plans? What do I do with a no? How do I manage a no? And what do I just concede or just go, okay, I guess it's no, or do I, and, and that's where you get into relationship. Like that's where relationship really shows up because there's a way to say, please, there's a way to say, Oh, come on. Can you just try it? Can you just try it once? You know? And, and if, if you're in a relationship with a horse where there is a, a give and take, there's actual feedback between both of you. I have yet to meet a horse that doesn't at least say, yeah, okay, I'll try it. I'll try it once. And then I'll show you if I can't, right? Because most horses are not going to say, I won't. Like just like you said before, they're not going, ha ha, you can't make me. They're not <laughs> out to get us. You know, they're not just trying to like give us a hard time. And, and even uh, horses with chronic injuries or, you know, they, whatever, you know, they have, they're, they're three-legged practically, will work if they love work, if they love you and they love what they're doing, they'll say, oh, I've got three legs, but that's okay. Let's do it anyway, because I'm, I feel good with you. I like being with you. And th there's other horses who are like, I twisted my ankle and I, I don't want to work for six months because they, they are not safe. They don't feel satisfied. They don't feel like they can be understood. So the, what I've discovered is by being able to give them not just autonomy, but also a specific um, baseline of messages that sets up a give and take in the relationship. There's a way to meet a no, like with a toddler who says, no, you could say, okay. And what do you do? You start redirecting. Right. You get what you want by redirecting and eventually they eat the eggs right? <laughs> well, or something like it. That's the, the, when you get that no, what we need to do is ask, why is that a no? Did they see something we didn't see? W was there an unsafe situation? Did I do something that really uh, upset them? Um, and, and, and that is, that is that conversation. That is that, how can I, and sometimes it's like, you might have to say, Hey, come on, give it a try. Cause it's not a really no, no. It's like a maybe no. Right. But then there's also the horse that's shut down and no is no. And you need to come in with a completely different perspective because exactly. that no has been uh, ingrained for something that you don't understand. It, like yeah. here, So this, this just came to mind a story where <clears throat> I was asked to try out this Western uh, reigning horse for our program. And this was many, many years ago. And I was one of a few teachers at this at this lesson barn. And so uh, I said, sure, sure, I'll try this horse out. So I did, I went through everything. How does he lead coming out of a stall? How does he cross tie? How is he getting him tacked? How is he? And what I noticed was that he was too good. Like that was actually a red flag. He mm -hmm. was he was too good. And he was also kind of pleasant to be around. And you know, if you gave him a carrot at the end, he'd take it nicely. There was a lot of things, but there was something off putting and in the polyvagal theory, you know, the polyvagal theory, um, that under underactive uh, part of the vagal system is, is equally as <clears throat> problematic <clears throat> as overreactive. And so I was like, ah, I'm feeling funny because this horse is too good. 
And so I got on him at the walk and he was fine. And we just, we did some patterns. We did this, we did that beautiful, excellent neck rainer, all this kind of stuff. But I kept feeling this underreactive, underreactive. And then I asked for trot and he turned into a porcupine. He bristled. And I went, yeah, okay, we're just going to walk. We'll just do some serpentine. And I'm going to think about a jog. I'm just going to think about it. And you, and you just see how that feels for you. And I had to think about a jog three times. He turned into porcupine, just porcupine, just thinking about it. And finally, on like the fourth time, he said, and he tried. And he did this little, but I could feel him just like, this is my, I can't do this thing. And I said, okay, that's, thank you for the effort. That's great. Thank you. And I hopped off and he took big breaths, yawning, big breathing out. And so I said to them, something's not quite right. I don't know what it is. I don't know. He's not limping. So I don't know if it's physical that's hiding. If, if it's a spine, if he's got a kissing spine, if it's a, I don't know what's going on. Something is up with this horse and I like him a lot. But I think that he needs more, more time uh, being assessed and maybe a little bit of time off to really get in there and see what he's all about before we would ever use him in a lesson. So another trainer came in and said, there's nothing wrong with this horse. And she got on and she spurred him into a trot and he broke her back. <gasps> so there's that, you know, and, and this is the thing of being able to be accurate with your assessment of what's going on. And sometimes no really is no. And what's what ended up when he did get evaluated after that, obviously he went through full evaluation and he did have, he had like a, a serious, something was like a, a hairline fracture in his hind leg or something. Something that wouldn't have caused him pain until he moved up into another pace with rider on his back. On his own, he could do it, but as soon as there's weight on his back and then whatever had happened to him about people making him do it, but they got him x-rayed and there was a thing. Well, and reining horses typically don't trot. They go straight to canter. Right. So that would have been another piece of that that would have put stress because you evaluate lameness at trot, not canter. <laughs> um, so, but fascinating. And so, yeah, it's um, when, I think the bottom line here, what we're trying to say is that Horses are typically attempting to comply. And when you get a non-compliance, you really need to stop and question why is there non-compliance, not make you do this because I said so. Um, and you know, it's, it, we're not perfect. Sometimes we get into those situations where it's like, I said, you gotta do this. And it's like, you know, no, 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 no. And, it's, um, and we need, and it's just that pause. It's being able to, to stop in our own Self, there's such a mirror reflection, right? And to pause for a second and go, wait a second, I need to reevaluate the situation because the because the bottom line is the horse doesn't have the brain to say, well, you know, um, the kind of thought patterns that we have, the categorical associations, but also that you did it yesterday. Why are you know? It's that they're so in the present moment with their senses. Or um, we had this uh, gentleman contact Sharon and say, you know. I've been loving horse speak and it's been great. And I've been greeting my horse and all this stuff and whatever. And he's been riding this particular horse. And then he said, wow, everything was really different today because I asked, I, you know, was in a rush and I was trying to get on my horse and he, and the horse didn't want to line up or do anything. And he's like, I forgot to greet the horse. And so he got off the mounting block, did the greeting and then the horse was fine. And so it was just like interesting how these little details that they appreciate that matter to that, them. that's a value. They want to be <laughs> greeted. It would be just like, you know, the thing of like having your friend come over and want to help you paint a room. And all you do is like, they show up and you hand them the paintbrush and let's go, you know, you don't have any kind of a, you know, chit chat first and, you know, talk about whatever. Yeah. And I, and the other thing is that once they're, once they know, that there's a level of communication, it's confusing when there isn't. I think that yes. that's what that story is. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, once you let the genie out of the bottle, if you will, you, you can't stuff it back in and expect to be able to just um, go back to what you were before. But that's so true of everything, right? Once yeah. You yeah, I think like when, when you start seeing, what I like about um, what I saw, you know, the, I always go back to the flashback to Equitana, what I liked so much about what I was seeing in front of me was watching horses find inner 
well-being and go into a, a personal process, which we now know what a personal process looks like, right? So a personal process is when they they go into this steady inner inner vision, you know, like the they they retreat from being worried about this and they are able to go and process themselves. Now they don't have an inner narrative the way we do because of how our brains work, but they do have an inner experience of themselves. Mm -hmm. And what it looks like to me, based on having seen this hundreds of times. You're talking about with Surefoot. Yeah, with, well with Surefoot or or when, when I do horse speak stuff and they go into a process. I like it when it's together because then it's there's a lot of more added to it. But bottom line, when I got to see horses in Equitana dropping into a process because they were on the pads, what's fascinating is that it's, it's an opportunity for them to finally go into that inner space while people are with them. Mm -hmm. And there's not another opportunity for horses in relationship to people to drop into that inner space. And I can get them there because I know what to say to them to say, you're welcome to go into a process with a bunch of people looking at you. And then the horses go, really? But in, in with the surefoot pads, what's great is the people don't necessarily know how to say all those things, but the pads say it. Mm. And the rule is hands off your horse as long as they're processing. Yeah. <laughs> and that gives them a chance to go, thank you. Cause their favorite thing to do with other horses is go into that, I call it the hold position. And it's like modified, they're not really sleeping, they're dozing, but there's one of the members of the herd remains in awareness while the others can like lick and chew over their experiences so far, kind of check them out, feel into them and release a lot of them. So they are fresh for the next moment. Otherwise their sponge fills up with too many experiences that they can't squeeze out. And I think with people, we fill their sponge because we have them do a lot of things that nature wouldn't be having them do. So. On it, when they're just horses being horses, they, you know, whoo, that was a spooky smell. Oh, they go, yeah, okay, I'm okay. Hmm, what's next, right? So they can, that's a natural process and it takes about that long. But when they've had experiences with us, sometimes they're confusing or they're traumatic or they're big or they're, or they just don't know like what to make of it, you know? And they need that time to just go internal and kind of let it wash through them and come to a new place and be ready for the next moment. And when they don't have a chance to process around humans, then it's hard for them to squeeze out the sponge and be ready for the next moment. And then you see habituated stress. That so over what time. it sounds to me like you're describing is that vagal reset, that, that ability to let go of whatever that stressor, big or small, yeah. may have been. And some take more time and less time, but that we, we are part of that stress to the vagal system Yes. Unless we provide the opportunity for them to discharge in our presence. Yes. In a quiet way. In a quiet yes. way. Yes. And we don't tend to see that as a valuable thing. We, we don't look at that as something valuable for the horse. We barely look at it as something valuable for ourselves. How many people say I should really learn to meditate and they don't. So like if we, you know, cause we're, we're kind of addicted to stress and we're, we think ahead, we think of the future and da, 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 da. It's just sort of who we are. But if you can be in the pattern of saying, this is an enrichment moment for me and my horse, where I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be the alert one so they can be the relaxed one. So they can go into that process with me present, with me here, then they seek that out in you. So they seek you out for this deeper nurturing connection, which is like, you're my buddy, you're my you're my person. You gave me space from the world and everything. So I could have a, a reset and come back to a good place. Otherwise we show up and we're like, I'm here, time to go. Blah, 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 blah. And then they're left to do what the best they can with that. So I always say, if a person put the stress in, a person needs to take the stress out. Mm, that's a great way of putting it. It's really a great way of putting it. So like when I saw riders, when I've seen riders sit on the horse, the rider has to sit there and, and they have to process a little bit too. Cause you ask them, what are you feeling? What are you feeling? And they have to go, I don't know. As the horse does this, you know? <laughs> I don't know. And then they start to go pretty good. You know? <laughs> so, so in that, in that sense, the, the horse is finally getting an opportunity to have their rider reset Yeah. while they reset. And for horses, they're like, this is, this is delicious. Can I have more? Yeah, fascinating. That's a fascinating way of looking at it because that that's uh, what I see is the riders 
then look at their horse in such a fresh way. They don't have all of that narrative in their head about what their horse does or doesn't do. Um, and it's also true, like when I do a surefoot workshop, I have to be so careful because if we do too many horses in succession, all the people are drooling. They've all reset to the point where they're like, I do, I have to be really careful because I lose them at about two hours, they're done. Um, yeah. I, I bet you find kind of the similar thing. You have to kind of keep the parasympathetic sympathetic kind of yes. around because if you just take them down, they're like done. <laughs> oh yeah, it, people, everyone's crying. The horses are lying down. The every, Everything just goes to the ground. Everything just yeah. Yeah. And I have to be like, okay, get up now. Well, we, gotta sympathetic. <laughs> we gotta we gotta get back, we gotta get back up on yeah. top of that wave. Yep. But at the same time, it's so valuable in my work. Horses start to expose their emotional state and they start to aim for um for lack of a better description, tougher emotions that maybe they can't normally express in the presence of a human. So the, the feelings of, of loneliness or sadness or grief, which they have, they grieve for relationships. They grieve if they uh, move around too much, they can get really thrown off by my environment is different. There's way too much on my nervous system to take in these new environments all the time. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things that horses might be feeling on an emotional level. And when you set them up to say, well, you know, show me, and then they go, oh, I can, then they do. And when they start showing you, it's like what happens to Surefoot, everybody starts drooling. But you, people also get instantly empathically aware that it's real because you have to, you have to see it to believe it, but you have to feel it to know it. You have to feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so all that stuff is really cool. And I like using the Surefoot pads to set up those, those events. I think what I've liked is, you know, I'll do a clinic and someone will say, how, oh, how do I get to the drooling place again? How do I, <laughs> how do we, how do we do that? And, and it comes up a lot. I'm like, do you have sure foot pads? Because once the horse has gone there once and the people have gone there once and you kind of know that's what you're aiming for. And then you take out the pads. What horses tend to do is go, Oh, it's, oh, it's time to, and if they don't want to process and they don't need to, mm -hmm. you know, you know, they'll just kind of go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, my horse is the classic, um, you know, for all the time I've been doing surefoot, he's like, eh, uh, until lately he's been, we've been dealing with some abscesses and so suddenly he likes them. And it, you know, it, a lot of people, um, they have that, you know, well, my horse doesn't like them. Well, no, your horse doesn't need them. <laughs> it's really, and then right. when your horse does need them, he will stand on them. But a lot right. of some horses don't need them. You know, they're, or Al is earth. He is the, you know, the mentor. This is everything stays steady. <laughs> yeah, that's Rocky. He was, I mean, he, at, after his uh, colic surgery, he definitely was He was into, into them. And now but he's now like, like, nah. Yep. You know, what's funny is Dakota um, seeks out her, we have those rubber um, feed buckets for that on the ground and she seeks them out and we'll just put a foot in them. Oh, interesting. Or if we line them up, she'll put all four feet in a, in a <laughs> bucket and she'll go, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> all right i'm gonna just show you my earth horse here before we finish and then we'll wrap this up and uh oh, where did he where did he go wait here he is so, there we go there's al he's got his head in the feed room of course <laughs> oh al but trying to get his ears up in the feed for in the feed room but here here he is actually hiding behind the hay feeder <laughs> All you can see is this little ear is just above there. <laughs> I'm, I'm tiny today. I'm tiny. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. He's cute. Yeah. So uh, once again, it's just so fabulous to talk to you, both of you, and, um, and see how, how, you know, we're, it's kind of, you know, sometimes you have the story of the elephant and everybody touches a different part and sees a different perspective. But I think what we're doing here is we're, just taking like ideas from Janet and from Kim and you and Surefoot and just, and all the other guests that I've had to help everybody understand this is one thing and the, and it's multidimensional. There are right. all different aspects that we can approach it and that can help us when we get stuck, when we get a no, how can we understand it so that we can get to yes. And I really, right. yes. you know, I'm so grateful for you guys to, to continue to come back and yak with me uh, time after time after time. Um, to help people understand their horses better. 
Of course. Thanks Thank for, you having, for us. having us. Love having Always you. We look forward to our, yeah. our monthly with you. Yep. <laughs> next month and we'll be in touch. And so, um, Thank you all for joining us. Thank you once again, Sharon and Laura, for uh, being my guest. And um, what's today? Oh, we're going to, well, hopefully, I just realized we don't have internet at the arena anymore, but hopefully we're going to be able to do a live balance trail using Surefoot Pads for People on Friday. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have to make a hotspot because they don't have the internet at the arena anymore like they did. But we'll figure it out. Either that or we'll move up here with it. Um, so stay tuned for that on Friday. And otherwise, have a fabulous day. And uh, everybody be well. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.